All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so it goes without saying autonomous vehicle is one of the most prominent um, application of uh, cyber physical systems. Um, a very interesting uh, approach to tackling and solving autonomous driving systems will be um, through autonomous racing. However, um, so solving autonomous racing uh, in a way makes sense because historically uh, autom automobile industry has received more innovation from the racing uh, community than from anywhere else, uh, actually. So communities such as Formula One or IndyCar series um, have, have contributed a lot to automobile industry in, uh, in history. So my name is Nitish Gupta, and uh, today I'll be presenting uh, an introductory session on autonomous vehicles and racing. Um, so the motivation for autonomous vehicle is very uh, simple, yet very hard to accept. Um, we as humans, are not very good at this task. Um, I'm sure we all have been distracted while driving at least once in our driving history. Um, kudos if uh, that's not the case. Uh, you have passed the Turing test. Uh, now, uh, one might uh, argue at this uh, on, on this point um, that that's not the case. Right? Uh, we are good at driving, but remember um, the the way our roads are structured um, were meant to be driven by humans. Um, they are they, they are basically human friendly. It is fairly a monotonous task for a robot to to drive uh, a car, but uh, it's the the challenges that we have created for ourselves uh, uh, are are the hindrance in getting this technology earlier. Um, the most important uh, reason for us to develop this technology is, is the number of death uh, uh, worldwide every year um, due to car accidents. And most of them, uh, about 94% in US uh, are due to human errors uh, or uh, some decision. So the number is pretty high, 1.35 million uh, per year. Uh, to give you perspective there, uh, currently there are total 5 million deaths, around 5 million deaths due to COVID pandemic. So uh, that means we have another overlooked constant pandemic due to road ca casualties, right? So um, another important reason uh, is the number of people who are differently enabled uh, or have low vision or belong to senior age group. Um, these sectors of communities either are either dependent on uh, on someone else or they drive themselves, which can be dangerous. So uh, that's why it's very important to have this technology developed as uh, early as possible. And uh, a lot of lot of uh, community people, a lot of industry uh, industrial companies uh, that are working in, in this domain. Um, in addition to solving above problems, uh, autonomous vehicle result. Uh, Will, will result in lesser or no road traffic or congestion, saving, saving us time and cost. Uh, uh, in addition, ride sharing uh, with autonomous vehicles might enable a new way of mobility that thus uh, further reducing the cost of owning a car and also infrastructure like parking spaces. Um, and finally, hopefully uh, these benefits will help us uh, heal our planet to some extent. Uh, so, what is an autonomous uh, i'm sorry about my dog he's okay uh, okay I'll, I'll continue so what is an autonomous vehicle um, one can easily uh, point out as uh, it's a car that drives itself without any human intervention right but the question arises for how long uh, can it drive for uh, in what location can it drive can it drive everywhere for, can it drive like forever uh, those are very important questions because um, because not only that uh, these challenges have not been addressed already, um, no, no company has uh, come to that level, a general system, autonomous system, which can drive anywhere for any amount of time. Uh, there are always fail ca failure cases at some point. Um, so that's why NASA, um, the, 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 the Highway Security Department of the United States have some regulations and safety levels and frameworks for around autonomous vehicles uh, to regulate the development. Now, these, these companies, um, in accordance to these uh, regulations, kind of uh, work in an ODD manner. So they have like operational design domains. So whenever we see a company uh, launching their autonomous vehicle around some California, uh, some, some locality in California, uh, for instance, recent uh, demo by Cruise, 
the 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 ODD is defined to be like one one uh, particular street around California, one town of California. So uh, that is because they have tested the vehicle robustly uh, around that street, and it is kind of aware of all the objects and kind of these ODD are really in, very intelligently chosen um, so as to kind of don't we don't overwhelm the vehicle with too much uh, uh, because these are these are still development under development right so we don't want to overwhelm ourselves uh, while we are developing this so uh, basically taking a ground up ground up approach um, now um, a community called SAE have defined six uh, different level of autonomy uh, around autonomous vehicles start from zero to five, um, five being fully autonomous and zero being no autonomy at all. The, the car cannot help you in any way. Um, we have uh, cars that are being driven at level three. There are a lot of companies um, already at level three. Um, level four has been achieved to some extent under certain condition or ODDs, as I said, um, but there is no car which can um, drive at level five. Um, which is like a general autonomous systems. Now, this is about um, autonomous vehicle. Obviously, this uh, this system these systems are very time critical and safety critical. So, racing. Why why do we bother about racing? Is because um, as we'll see in the next video, um, there are so many cases that uh, one cannot predict while uh, the car is driving on road. There are so many unpredictable behavior, and to react to these uh, these uh, these challenges one needs to be very um, high responsive, like uh, uh, the, the time to respond is very critical in these cases. And racing gives us that. Um, we, in racing, we are moving at high speed and we need to react very fast um, to certain. And obviously in racing, um, we encounter these challenges more frequently, these edge, edge cases more frequently. And we don't, we don't worry about crashing um, unless it's obviously a full-size vehicle. But if it's, it's like a one-tenth scale, which I'm going to discuss, it's all right to crash. Um, uh, it's all right to experiment as much as you can. It's it's not same as a safety oriented development uh, as in industry, like uh, for actual autonomous vehicle, where they kind of have certain environment which is controlled and they kind of uh, find their own cases. Um, um, it's very hard to find a case where when where which has not been encountered any any time. Uh, um, in the in the driving history of that vehicle, so um, yeah, that makes the problem a little, little bit easier. Also, racing um, gives us high speed dynamics, so um, we need to figure out what are the dynamic at such high speeds so that we can control the vehicle more efficiently. And then uh, there is a very a low response time requirement um, in autonomous racing because because of high dynamics, basically. So once we have some um, solid developments in autonomous racing, these developments will in turn help autonomous vehicle to become better for future. So let's take a look at this video where it shows some confusion cases for autonomous vehicles. So in this one, um, there are some stickers of people riding the bikes and it's kind of detecting. It's fine, this can be mitigated using a 3D uh, sensor, LiDAR, this is confusing the camera. Um, in this one, uh, it's detecting, is it one car or multiple car? And uh, I mean, it depends on how you implement your algorithm. These can be easily confused by, let's say a Tesla. Uh, and fun fact, I was when I was searching through all these uh, confusion cases, I found a lot of Tesla cases. Uh, so I don't know what that means, but yes. <laughs> So in this one, it, see, it thinks that there's a gap between the truck and it keeps driving and bang. Um, this one is a fun one. Um, one would think that the, the truck is coming on head on to you, to, towards you, but actually uh, when you look, it's just being towed. So it appears that it's coming. So the car might react differently based on based on what it sees, right? And even, even LiDAR will get confused because yeah, um, there will be like tracking things that need to come in place in that case. In this one, the stop sign is confused with the logo of a, of a restaurant. And this one, there are some signboards with signs which are not actual signs, but the car thinks that they are actual signs. These are all fun. Um, 
in this one, the car thinks it's it, there's a bus alongside, but actually there are two, there's a washer and dryer and the, the, the doors of washer and dryer kind of looks like a, a bus wheels and it thinks there's a bus right beside it. So, and there are some challenges due to weather. Um, sensor might get fogged, there might be rain. This one is very unnecessary. This truck, the driver has modified his truck to look uh, reverse, like it's actually driving right, but the back of it is looks it looks like front of it. And then we can have objects covering our sensors or, so yeah, this one is very interesting because as it enters the tunnel, you'll notice right here. So right here, you'll notice there is a reflection sunlight uh, along the road and the car thinks that it's a lane line. Uh, the camera sees the lane line and it, it kind of swerves towards the right, so. And then, yeah, so basically we have a lot of challenges uh, uh, still to tackle and slot of edge cases, which, so in all these scenarios, uh, uh, one cannot expect a car to react very fast unless it has some experience, experience in reacting fast, like what we get during autonomous racing. Um, we get more frequent edge cases. We, we get more frequent, we, we face these such scenarios more frequently. So this all started um, uh, in 2005 with the DARPA competition um, in which uh, a car called Stanley from Stanford uh, team uh, won the challenge and it, it used a lot of LIDARs and this was like, a, it paved a way towards a Google self-driving car, which used to look like a small funny car. Um, then they renamed it to Waymo and moved to a bigger car. Um, now they have fleets running all over Michigan and a lot of other places in US. And then we have cruise automation. Um, and it's something what the future might look like without steering at level five. Um, I don't know how soon that's gonna be, but yes. Um, and along with these developments, uh, the top developments, um, community also decided to take this challenge to themselves and kind of develop racing community uh, to build this platform um, from ground up um, and at different scales so that they can kind of um, experiment without being worrying about the safety of the vehicle. So these are like some of the challenges. This is uh, some of the communities. This one is a DIY Robocar, first one. So a large community, global community. Um, then the second one was MIT race car, but it's not active development, but it got popular. And then we have uh, recently uh, uh, demoed Indy Autonomous Challenge. And then uh, the one that we participate, our lab participate uh, every six months, it's F1 10th. Uh, this is um, what we're going to discuss more. Yes. Hi, Nitish. Yeah, I just had a question regarding uh, these competitions. Are these competitions or kind of like vehicles more kind of like research oriented or is it more kind of like oriented towards innovations trying to come up with like you know better solutions on these challenges so both of your points are actually research oriented right uh, oh yeah okay <laughs> yeah. Like you're coming with some innovation it's basically you're you're contributing to some research in, in yeah, yeah if you have an algorithm that has never been demoed uh, showcased before and your your car wins basically you have a edge over other algorithms and yeah uh, this yeah all, uh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go, no, ahead. go ahead yeah so these challenges are kind of in a way, uh, so the ch th these challenges are not designed to um, to help you like with the hardware, they give you all the build instruction, you don't have to struggle with that. All they care about is what algorithm you design uh, to drive uh, on these cars, uh, so as to win the race. Right. Uh, yeah, and, and I kind of like see how a lot of this kind of like goes from you know, like actual vehicles to use like smaller things. Do you think that kind of like gives a better like um, ground for development, kind of like starting out with something that's smaller that won't do as much damage versus an actual vehicle? Or do you exactly. think it is still like in the best interest to also do it like on actual vehicles? So that's what, so uh, the, the F110 and all these communities, they are 
targeting mainly a, a lower scale, like one tenth or one eighteenth. But the Indy Autonomous Challenge was kind of full scale. This is like a full scale Formula One car, and they raced um, autonomously. Uh, um, um, yeah, in the recent challenge, and uh, a uni uh, university, uh, technical university of Munich, won this challenge. Uh, I, I think last year. Yeah. So right. they are both both approaches are being taken. They are there are small scale, there are full scale. Um, there's there simulation based. A lot of um, um, autonomous racing related platforms are available for us to work on. All right, thank you. Sure. So um, that's about the how it developed over the years, and then. Um, a typical uh, autonomous vehicle consists of several sensors on on the on the on the hood and on the everywhere around the car, so as to get a good view of its environment, so that so that it can make better decisions. So there is radar for long range, there is lidars um, for short, for for moderate range, and getting the depth around the around the environment of the vehicle. And then there, there are cameras to get um, to get better perception of objects um, and make sense of what they are detecting them. And then there are short range uh, uh, radars uh, for obstacle avoidance and emergency braking. And then um, there are ultrasonics, ult ultrasound sensors uh, also around the vehicle. This image primarily depicts a aid as application, but um, this is how a typical autonomous vehicle also uh, hosts its sensors. So I'll go ahead and discuss uh, a very basic uh, uh, data flow of, uh, of a typical architecture. Uh, this is borrowed from uh, AutoWare paper. So this figure shows the basic uh, control flow, as I said, uh, for an autonomous vehicle. It's a, it's a cyber physical system um, and which can be abstracted into sensing, computing, and then the final one, actuating, actuation modules. Um, sensing devices such as um, uh, laser scanners, cameras, are typically used for uh, self-driving in urban applications, uh, urban areas. Um, the actuation modules uh, handle steering and acceleration whose control commands are typically generated by the path planning module path following map module or path planning module, yeah. Um, and so basically, if you look from here, the sensing part, we have all the sensors. So this is a 3D map. This is a high definition uh, 3D semantic map of the environment that AutoWare uses. Actually, most of the company uses apart from Tesla. Um, they only use cameras as a sensor. So this uh, 3D map is used to, uh, is very helpful in localization because um, you can, if you are relying only on your odometry and uh, uh, inertial measurement unit uh, data for your pose estimation, you quickly deviate from uh, your your confidence become too low after a while because uh, the error accumulate over time. So 3D map is very helpful in in mapping yourself and localizing yourself in the in the in the given map, right? So um, then in this. Uh, AI, basically, I call this AI module. In this module, you do localization and then do some computer vision, detect your objects around, uh, detect the objects around you. It could be traffic lights, it could be a person, it could be um, uh, signs, all those things. And then um, there's also sensor fusion going around here. Um, then you do for each of these objects detected in the environment, um, you do prediction. And um, prediction is basically saying tracking the objects, tra predicting their behavior um, uh, using some algorithm that I'll discuss in a bit. Uh, then there's decision that goes um, uh, after this, because after, after you have found what objects are in the environment, you also want to decide your car to decide what behavior it should take, right? Uh, what is the decision that it should take after uh, getting the data from the environment? Just getting the data is not enough. So with the data and with the decision, the decision that you get, uh, you kind of do your motion planning, your mission planning, uh, local and global planning, and come up with a command um, for actuation. So those can be um, acceleration um, and steering and our brake also. So that's like a very basic flow of this. Um, this is how a so auto of how the AutoWare software stack looks like from the operating system perspective, uh, there are applications on green. Now, um, this is mainly consists of CAN interface. Um, uh, okay, so that 
I think goes down below with the sensors actually. So all the sensors and the uh, system and the vehicle, they are like drive by wire and all. They, those are all together connected using a canvas. And from if I, if I go from top, um, there are these modules that are developed by Autoware also. And there are, there are more companies actually, there's Apollo. Um, so they kind of have very similar structure. So these are all the modules that I just discussed. Um, the control one goes all the way down to the operating system because it is time critical. Um, then they, we have uh, several um, uh, runtime libraries. They, those are available for us. Um, as uh, Sudarshan discussed in the last one, we have ROS and we have several open source uh, uh, libraries like PCL for processing point cloud and then CUDA for GPU uh, compute and then CAFE for deep learning and OpenCV for image processing. And then we have our operating system layer and then all the sensors over here. So this is like hardware and there are more sensors, but this good abstraction, right? So um, moving to the next one, um, this one depicts how each of these modules kind of work in, in, the, in, the, on the, in an autonomous vehicle. So the top one kind of shows a 3D map of the environment with all the semantic information available like traffic signal and signs and buildings and everything. Um, and then we kind of scan our data using LIDAR, um, point cloud using LIDAR and then do a matching of, uh, of this point cloud to the 3D map that we have available and then kind of localize us uh, uh, ourselves in, in this 3D map using another algorithm similar to particle filter, more advanced than particle filter, which, will, which I'll discuss in, in, in some time. Um, then there's a lot of deep learning for uh, pedestrian detection, car detection, other object detection. And then there's estimation for uh, where these objects must be moving. Um, so we keep a history of, of all the list and then use algorithms like Kalman filter, uh, unsentient Kalman filter to keep a track of, of all these objects. Um, um, then um, we have like a decision to make. In this one, you can see like there is a traffic sign and then uh, this one, it detects like it's a red traffic sign. And then what's the decision to make in these cases when you encounter these scenarios and then you have a, your path planning module, which kind of finds a path to the destination and solves um, it. Yeah, these are algorithm mainly around. So one of the popular one is A star and then there's hybrid A star. I'll discuss A star in, in a bit. Um, then there's uh, uh, motion planning, and then uh, this is like a control of which which path you should be following. Um, then this actually control. So uh, you get your waypoints, and you follow your waypoints using your control signals. It's a good picture a depiction of um, uh, of of how the different modules process data and come up with some decision. Moving to the next slide. This is how, from Ross perspective, the system looks. Um, uh, the, the, the round ones are nodes and the square ones are topics. Um, there's a LiDAR uh, node that publishes 3D point cloud. For instance, I'm, I'm going through this red chain. We read the point cloud, we filter the point cloud, and then the localizer kind of uh, uses other data, other sensors data and the 3D map to localize ourselves and gives out a current pose of the vehicle. And then this vehicle pose is used for uh, decision-making and then finding the waypoints, which is then given to the actuation module uh, to follow those waypoints. So here we get um, a series of uh, like steering angle and velocities, if you will, uh, to which which the vehicle is supposed to follow. So that the following part is for the control to handle. And then um, going back to the autonomous racing, so the, what I discussed was a generic autonomous vehicle stack, right? From racing perspective, things look slight different. Um, as I said, there are some, several communities that are working towards uh, developing such systems. There are also several simulators uh, that you don't even need any hardware. You, know, you don't need to spend a single penny and you can get started with these softwares, with these simulators. And um, this one is particularly held, uh, hosted every month. You can participate in the donkey sim uh, 
um, with the donkey sim simulator with DIY robo cars, you can join their discord and get started right away. And even their hardware is not cheap, but the F110 may be slightly on the expensive side. I'll uh, move to the next slide and discuss about F110 in particular. So this is uh, something that we have been developing in our own lab as well. Um, this is F110 hardware. Um, it has all these, uh, can be divided into four categories, uh, although I, I'll ignore this last one. The first one is basically chassis design. Um, the, the mounting of all the components, the, the 3D printed parts and how you're going to align all these designs, mechanical designs go on this one. And then we have several sensors. We have several um, other electronics um, that goes on this vehicle and we need to figure out um, how these should be placed on the, on, the, on the platform. And then we have a software system architecture, um, which I'll discuss in a bit. So the hardware for F110 uh, looks like this. Now, one might think that this is like a toy car, but it is not. It is actually very similar to um, a four wheel drive electric car, um, for instance, Tesla. Um, the, the, the mechanism, the, the, the ideas are very similar in terms of how it drives and it has suspension, it has a shaft, drive shaft, it has differential drive and it has uh, Ackerman steering. All these things are, are, are borrowed from the real car and put in this uh, F110 scale. So as to mimic a very realistic uh, um, platform for develop, developing these systems, right? Um, so that we can go in reverse and kind of also uh, have all the algorithms that we develop on these platform with a little tweaking, um, work, make, it, make them work on the actual platforms. Um, that's the goal. Um, I'll move ahead and, okay. So about the, okay, I'm not sure. I think one of the, okay, this, this should be, there's supposed to be a LiDAR around here, which is missing. Are you guys able to see? No, right? Yeah, so there's supposed to be a LiDAR. Um, I don't know where it went, but uh, it's a 2D LiDAR. Uh, LiDAR is basically a um, 3D point cloud uh, mapping device, uh, kind of, uh, which gives us a, uh, a point cloud with uh, each point representing, representing the distance of the object from the LiDAR point of view. So um, we have we do have three D lidars in market, but for this platform F110, we use two D lidar. Which by by two D, I mean it only sweeps points around a single plane. It's not um, sweeping vertically. So there are actual lidars that go on autonomous vehicle are sweeping. Um, they are sweeping on a horizontal plane, but they are all also they have vertical channels, uh, maybe like sixty four channels. So for each angle, they are also getting vertically sixty four points. Uh, if you will, um, around the around the car. So the one that we are using though is a planar lidar. Um, we get a two D point cloud around thousand points, um, and the scan rate is hundred millisecond uh, takes for one scan. Then we have a, a two forty degree um, range of this lidar. Some lidar do rotate like full three sixty degree, but this one is has limits, so it kind of goes for back and forth uh, to scan. Um, the, the point cloud that we get out of this is uh, is a very very good resolution. That's why this slider itself costs about fifteen hundred dollars, um, contributing to most of the price of the F110 platform. So it's it's a good resolution, um, 0.36 degree uh, distance between each point. Then the the compute platform that we use, the embedded circuit that we use on this platform is Jetson, Jetson PX2. It has a Pascal architecture, uh, NVIDIA's. Um, then it has 256 CUDA cores and 4 GB memory and then um, other specifications. This is a depth camera. Uh, it's called Z. And then they also we also have structure. And then we have RealSense, all these different companies, different, um, different products. They all do the same thing. They give us a, uh, a map, a 3D map of, uh, of environment. Unlike LiDAR, this also gives us like point around vertical axis also, but it's not channel wise. It's, uh, it's, it's based on stereoing uh, 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 concept. So um, a, a typical platform uh, for autonomous driving should consist of a initial measurement unit, which in case of F110 is inbuilt um, uh, inside WESC 
which is a speed controller that goes on the hardware. Um, I don't think I'm going to talk about it, but WESC is like a speed controller. You can have a wide range of speed variation and a fine at a very and you can control it at a very, very fine level. So that WESC has uh, an IMU inbuilt and it can give you positional uh, data um, for the car. So uh, like acceleration and yaw pitch roll angles. Okay, next. Um, I So the, the software architecture is pretty much very simplified for F110. Um, we have all the sensors as usual. Um, we skip some sensors we don't have i think ultrasonic uh, ultrasonic ultrasound sensors on these platform but um, i mean we can put them but yeah the standard build doesn't have it so all these sensors give out data we do some filtering um for the lidar uh, data or maybe other data also and then we can also do map generation using the lidar data um so it will kind of generate a 2d map of environment for us and then we have computer vision module, which can find obstacles, for instance, and maybe like um, finding out um, 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 other other obstacle, maybe. Um, then all this, the data that we process from this side of the uh, planning module goes to localization and path planning. Localization is, as I said, I'll, I'll discuss in a bit in, I think, next slide. Um, when we localize ourselves in the environment, um, we also find a path for us to follow, for the car to follow, and it's this, this, these in uh, this, this data for like uh, steering, what should be the steering at um, certain future steps uh, given out by planning module, and also like velocity at, at those corresponding point are given to uh, the control module to for it to follow it, and then control module may in turn employ some PID controller to to kind of uh, efficiently follow the path. So here's a, I'm not sure why these images are not showing. Let me try to. Um, okay. This one out here and show you. Okay, this is the lidar that I was talking about was missing in the image. So uh, the localization uh, module that I was talking about. Um, uses a lidar um, for localizing itself now why why do we use lidar why not use gps or um, imu uh, data anyone why not use gps for instance gps can give us position right um i'd say it's because of latency that is one thing um more um problematic is uh, the accuracy. Uh, GPS data is not accurate. Even when you are driving using Google Maps without an autonomous car, it's not reliable, right? As you might have experienced at some point. So GPS data is not that reliable. It's not accurate. It is, um, it, it, its accuracy is around um, sub, sub meters, uh, maybe it's not centimeter level accuracy, which is required in this platform. Um, for IMU or wheel encoder um, that are present in, so wheel encoder is not present inside WESC, but IMU is present inside WESC. Um, it gives us positional information uh, such as velocity and acceleration. We can do um, uh, something called dead reckoning, um, which is traditionally being used in automobile um, systems to kind of estimate your position when you, are, when you enter a tunnel. Uh, 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 where GPS is now unavailable. So that localization is possible, but the, the problem with uh, it is uh, that over the time it accumulates a lot of error and then your uncertainty of where you are and the environment increases and your confidence decreases basically. So uh, for that purpose, what we do is we use a pre-recorded, assume that a map is given to you by Oracle and then uh, this LiDAR uh, 
point cloud that we get, we kind of try to match it um, with, the, with the map that we have and find our location. Um, how that works is coming uh, in the next slide. So here is what AutoWare uses, a 3D semantic map as I discussed uh, earlier. So the scan matching problem is uh, pretty standard. Um, we use an algorithm called iterative closest point, ICP. It's a very well-known algorithm. The, the, the problem is formulated as uh, we have source point, we have target points. In this case, X are the target point and P are the source point, right? So you want to fit your source point onto the target point like, uh, like this, let's see, like this. Can you see that animation? So we want to fit our source object to the target object. Uh, and this ICP algorithm kinds of helps us finding the rotation and translation vector, um, rotation matrix and translation vector, which can um, map the set of source points to the target points and minimize the mean square, uh, root mean square error. Um, now, this is very simple algorithm. We do it iteratively, we find a, local rotational matrix and the translation vector, and then keep doing that. And eventually after a few iteration, we have a good match. But um, you can imagine um, this being failed because if, if your initial orientation is too far from, how this works is basically from the source point to the target point, you kind of start matching the closest point that you can find for each point in the source point, right? So if these, this orientation is totally messed up and uh, it's, it's far away or messed up, whatever, um, when you try to match it, it will find a good fit, but it might not be a perfect uh, alignment. So the root mean square might show you very less, but in actual case, uh, the, the point cloud is, um, the matching is all messed up. So for this, Pro, th this is problem for ICP, and the way we solve it is to give it initial pose estimate for it to match because we have that data from our um, from our IMU or we have some rough data, right? So we can use that data to give it a kind of relative uh, position for it to transform. So this is the way it kind of matches. I'll move to the next slide. I think this should work now. No, okay. Okay, I'll just continue with this. So in this one, um, we I show you the matching on actual car. You see that the green one may be uh, a semantic 3D map, and then the blue one is the fit that you find um, using ICP kind of algorithms. So once you have found a good fit, you have found a transform, rotation, and, uh, and translation. What's the next step is is to localize. So this match could be at multiple places, right? It's it's not necessary that um, in the environment that maybe you are in a corridor, how do you localize yourself in that case, right? Uh, because uh, scan might be matching at multiple places, more than one. So for that, we use a, a very interesting algorithm called part particle filter or its modifications. Uh, how this works is it samples around a uniformly, it samples some points uniformly around the environment and it assigns a weight to each point um, based on its probab based on how well the measurement of the car fits um, this point in the in the in the in the environment right so for instance um, suppose this this vehicle it, as it's navigating it see you can see the points are uh, coming together but now you still see some points around here and then here why is it because this structure and this structure looks very similar right it thinks the it now these two are estimations, right? When as soon as it enters inside the one above, it vanishes the one below because it sees a a, a tie breaking structure around inside the this one, right? This room. So this is how it can accurately localize itself with the with the information of a map. So and also yeah yeah map helps us measuring. So every this iteration goes like you measure. And then you update your confidence, you measure and you update your confidence by confidence, I mean points. So yeah, there's an algorithm called importance sampling. You can maybe, I, I think. So I have some of these implemented. If you're interested, I can share this with you and uh, maybe uh, like explain a little bit of this. This is a pipe, like a sim simple particle filter implementation. And then I have another path planning implementation around here um, for A star. So um, 
Yeah. Um, for so this was about particle filter. I'll move to next one, which is. Sorry to interrupt, Nitish. I, I have to go for, for the upcoming course. I make you the host already, so uh, we can continue. Uh, but sorry, guys, I have to go now. Sure. Um, sorry, it took a lot <laughs> more time than I expected, uh, but I have a few more slides, just a few more slides. So for path planning, um, typically, um, the industry uses, even AutoWare uses a hybrid A-star, uh, but here I'll explain a simple one, which is A-star. Uh, it's a heuristic-based algorithm. Um, just a second. Yeah, it's a, it's a heuristic-based algorithm, kind of uh, extension to Dijkstra, um, which we are, we, you, most of you must be aware of. Um, so how this works is at each node, it has information from the, uh, from the, previously recorded heuristic that how far it is from that node to the goal, right? And then we also have information of how far we have come from the start node. So this kind of addition of these two numbers gives us a cost of reaching to the, to the goal state. So uh, if you look into the actual implementation, it's very interesting algorithm, um, very easy to implement also. I have a simulation based environment for this, um, if you would like to, no more. Um, so it can be Manhattan distance, which is basically four corners. So your robot can only move four directions, but it can also be Euclidean base where your robot can move diagonally. And in that way, you will have to explore a lot lesser states than Manhattan distance because you can move directly to the diagonal state. Um, coming to the control side, very simple slide. I didn't work much on this because, uh, yeah, it's self-explanatory. So we use uh, once we have like a path to follow from the path planning planning module, your controller's job is to efficiently follow that path. Um, it's it's not as uh, simple as it sounds. Um, you need to tune a lot of parameters for it to work, um, and then uh, to make it to make the the tracking very smooth um, and not very wobbly. You need to tune a lot of things in here. Um, so F110 kind of have an, an, an interface for, for implementing all these things. So in community, a lot of algorithms have been explored. I'll quickly go through the list. Uh, there, are, there are very basic ones, which are called reactive algorithms, uh, in which basically you do not do any future prediction. You only um, rely on your current state and your current sensor measurement and basically make a decision. So um, uh, an example could be lane keeping or following the wall or the center or following the gap, which is an interesting algorithm um, commonly used by F110 teams. Uh, in races. And then there's a disparity extender, which we also used to use, but we are, we are moving to a different one. So um, there could be learning-based algorithms. Uh, this one um, uh, could be deep learning-based purely. So you kind of give get collect your data by driving your car around the track uh, for a long time. And then using that data, you train your model to output st uh, the steering and uh, acceleration commands and make it drive uh, based on how uh, the data shows it to drive, right? Then it could be reinforcement learning based. A lot of these simulators are in platforms are offering gym environment for you to explore RL based algorithm. Um, so that one is based on experiencing the environment and kind of uh, going and colliding and doing and colliding again and kind of learning from that. Optimization based is something that we are looking into right now. Um, this one, first one is already being used by a lot of teams. They kind of do a offline optimized optimize line calculation and then kind of uh, have a PID controller to follow that line. And if there is an obstacle, they turn to reactive algorithms and um, make decision right there and then again, follow the optimized line. Then there could be a model predictive control, which is a very um, advanced algorithm. Uh, optimization based, I'll discuss it in a bit. Um, there could be more research based um, uh, projects for uh, maybe like real time scheduling related, V2V communication uh, based, and then it could be computer vision based. Um, following the gap, do you want me to discuss all this? Uh, I can quickly go through it uh, if you want. So, this very simple algorithm um, you kind of find from your LiDAR points, you kind of find the largest gap. 
using some threshold value, you find the largest gap and try to, okay. I thought I left the meeting. Uh, so you, we find the largest gap and kind of steer and um, move in that direction. But um, there was a small tweak by UNCC team and what they, did, what they found out that if you just follow the largest gap, you might collide because your car is not uh, aligned, right? It's, it has width. So uh, what, it, what they did was um, they kind of find, find a disparity between corresponding points and then uh, negate all the points that are close to this wall and kind of make them uh, equal to the wall distance. And then the largest gap changes to this line maybe, and then you move over there and not the, the way that you were moving earlier. So. So this, this, this resampling of points is based on the width of the car. And then learning based algorithms, I'm not going to, so um, NVIDIA uh, some time ago, some years ago, um, explored this, this part of uh, uh, driving using uh, experience data, driving for hours, and then using that data to directly train your deep neural network to predict um, control commands. So, um, but I, um, uh, us at artists don't feel that this is a way to go because it can it, it it heavily relies on on your data recording and how you train um, and it's very brittle. Um, you can easily find the edge case which is not in your data and screw up. Um, so model predictive control is a very advanced optimization algorithm. Uh, it basically works by following a trajectory, which is given, maybe given by um, path planning module, or it could be uh, calculated by the model predictive control itself. It depends on how well you have designed your cost function. So the cost function can, for, for racing, you can have a cost function to minimize the lap times. So to maximize the progress, basically. Um, then this is a convex uh, op uh, constraint optimization problem, and we use uh, several quadratic solvers to solve this. Uh, sorry, uh, quadratic solvers of the shelf, quadratic solver to solve uh, these problems. Uh, it's also known as receding horizon prediction problem because um, in MPC, we kind of uh, not only find an immediate control signal, we find a control signal for, for a particular horizon length. So if, if your length is like 10, for 10 steps in, uh, um, in future, you kind of, um, find your control, your vehicle's position, your vehicle state um, in, in the, in the uh, um, environment. So based on what your current state is and based on what your current input signal are, um, you find this uh, uh, state of the vehicle at each step in the horizon. And the first command, we do this calculation every iteration in the control loop, but only the first command is taken uh, for actuation. And then we recalculate at every step, we recalculate the entire horizon again. So basically we throw away all the other, um, other, other calculations and just execute the first one. But other ones are e important because uh, you're also doing prediction kind of. So you need that. Um, this obviously requires uh, model dynamics uh, to be known. Um, so that was about uh, all the existing work that there are. You can come up with more ideas and you can discuss uh, this uh, after this presentation anytime. I'm open uh, for discussion and uh, I'm available mostly in HEC 404. Uh, you can shoot me an email and uh, uh, maybe, yeah, join, join the team, uh, volunteer with us. So thank you so much. I'll take questions now.